Welcome everyone to the Metrics International Forum. The forum is organized by the, the, by the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, or short to Metrics. The center is directed by John Ioannidis and Steve Goodman, and we are a research group and fellowship program dedicated to finding ways to improve the validity and transparency of scientific research. I'm Lena Koppel, I'm a visiting postdoc at Metrics, and I will be today's moderator. All of the forums are recorded and can be accessed on our website. So please uh, mute yourself during the talk and keep your questions until the end um, or write them in the chat. Our presenter today is Vincent Lervier. Uh, Vincent Lervier holds the UNESCO Chair on Open Science at the University of Montreal, where he is a professor of information science and associate vice president for planning and com communications. He's also scientific director of the Erudite uh, Journal Platform, associate director of the uh, Science and Technology Observatory, and a regular member of the Inter-University Research Center in Science and Technology. He holds a BA in Science, Technology, and Society, uh, an MA in History of Science, and a PhD in Information Science and has also performed postdoctoral work at Indiana, Indiana University uh, Department of Information and Library Science. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to our speaker. Good. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Uh, what I'm going to present today is a piece that we've been working on for actually quite a while. It, it took us a while also to get the uh, computational power to run that. Uh, but you'll see that uh, la la later in the results. So we're basically looking here at self-citations and, and whether there's some, they are something that is normal, so a pure consequence of the fact that we are mostly working in cumulative fields and that our career trajectory build on the stuff that we wrote before, or whether they're actually affected by research evaluation practices uh, and that we would have all of the incentives in the world to self-cite our own uh, work. Uh, so quick outline, um, so I'm going to give some context on the rise of research evaluation and, and go uh, give an overview of various criticism that exists on citation analysis, uh, then try to clarify what self-citation mean, especially at the individual level and how we should be uh, measuring uh, them. Um, then I'll run two analysis or I'll present two analysis. One which looks at both self-citations and self-references. And, and in the literature, th those two things are actually quite often conflated. Uh, they don't mean the same thing. They're the same act, but it's not the same calculation and they have to be interpreted differently. So how, how do those two things vary over the career of researchers? Uh, and then to look at the, let's say the, the relationship between cited paper and citing paper to see whether self-citation are more or less related to uh, the paper that is uh, citing those papers. Uh, looking at this semantic similarity between millions of pairs of citing and cited papers. And then we'll draw some, uh, some com conclusion. So uh, as Lina said, keep the questions for the end. But if you have some during the talk, I, I would say don't hesitate to ask them because it's sometimes the right time to uh, to ask questions. Okay, so of course the context here is a context that most of us are aware, the growth of research evaluation based on bibliometrics. 30 years ago, scientists were citing and publishing, but they were not aware that they could be measured in any way. Now scientists are reflexive. They know that any publication and citation act is associated in some way to the allocation of symbolic capital and of prestige. Uh, in some countries in the world, citation analysis has replaced peer review. In China, for instance, in order to get your thesis at several universities, you need to publish two papers in journals indexed by the Web of Science. That becomes a criteria. We don't need to review thesis anymore. Papers just have to be published and, and we're done. Um, promotions are also awarded based on reaching certain thresholds in terms of, of citation. Of course, this is partly due to the rise in university rankings uh, and in many ways uh, due to the fact that many universities care about university rankings. Uh, so all of that kind of change the incentive structure of academe. And in that context, publish, publishing becomes, publishing and in many ways citing uh, has become something that is quite crucial 
to, uh, to, to researchers. And it's quite interesting, given that we're in the, the week of the Nobel Prizes, uh, to contrast that with the physics Nobel Prize of 2013, uh, Peter Higgs, who basically stopped publishing in 1979 and won the Nobel Prize in two, again in 2013. Um, and Peter Higgs published roughly less than 20, <clears throat> sorry, less than 20 papers uh, across his entire career. Uh, most of us have published more than that in the last year. Uh, so again, that reminds us that winning the Nobel Prize is not a pure consequence of writing a certain number of papers, or in other words, that the Nobel Prize is not won by a number of papers, and that perhaps uh, we are uh, over, uh, over publishing because we are driven to, to publish like that. Um, in some countries, and again, China is probably the, uh, the most important example there, uh, they have cash per publication policies uh, that are modulated by, by impact factors. So basically, you publish in a journal that has an impact factor of 10, you get $10,000 as a cash bonus. And these amounts are not, um, are not for research purposes. They're salary complements. Uh, and so if you publish in Science, or Nature, or PNAS in some of these universities, in, it can go as high as roughly one hundred and fifty thousand dollars as a as a cash supplement. Uh, so again, this changes the incentive uh, structure. Uh, quite interestingly, though, and that, that's a paper that that I did with uh, one actually of your former uh, or uh, former affiliated researcher Daniele Fanelli, where we basically looked at: Do we actually see a rise in researchers' productivity? Are are researchers being more and more Productive in in different cohorts, uh, and so we took the, the the papers written during the first fifteen years of the career, and basically the uh, the answer is a is a bit mixed in the sense that if you take full counting, where basically everyone gets a paper, even in cases of multiple co-authorships, then of course researchers are more productive, so CVs are longer uh, for more recent cohorts. But if we take fractional counting. Uh, whereby we would normalize the number of papers by the number of authors that are on those papers. Well, actually, it's more or less stable over time. That, in many ways, the scientific community per researcher is roughly as productive as it was uh, as it was before. And that being said, of course, we do see an exponential growth in the number of papers that are that are being published, and these are only the data since uh, 1980. But it's quite striking to see that. Globally, as a as a group of scientists, we went from about 3.5 million papers uh, in 2010 to more than 7 million papers. Uh, well, since since 2020, uh, which is ba which means that we we basically doubled that. Of course, part of the increase comes from China, India, um, and what one could call emerging countries. But the system is indeed publishing more uh, and more. Okay. So moving on to the criticism of citation analysis, which is something that is not, not new. There's classic papers from McRobert and McRobert from the 1970s and, and 80s, uh, as in right after the start of large-scale citation analysis. Um, and so that have been quite critical of that. So of course, one typical criticism is that it takes time for citations to accumulate, um, that there are some unsighted influences, so not everything gets cited, uh, not everything that has influence gets cited. There's also, according to Merton, the concept of obliteration by incorporation, uh, which basically states that as work becomes kind of canonized in a, in a given field, it stops being cited because it's kind of part of the, of the common knowledge. Uh, we also hear sometimes that yeah, most citations are negative and that th there would be a lot of the citations that are in there that are actually being negative. And this is something that we looked at with, with colleagues from uh, actually from several countries a couple of years ago. I think, I think Kevin Boyack is, on, is also uh, on, on the conference, who was one of the uh, lead authors of, of that piece. Um, and so in order to study that, actually, we, we had access to the full text of uh, several million papers uh, published by Elsevier. Um, and what we tried to extract from those papers were the citation context to actually try to assess whether negative citations are actually important <laughs> in science. Um, and this was made actually mostly through uh, creating a list of uh, keywords and expression that kind of marked uh, a signal of having a, a negative citation. And these uh, 
these uh, these negative keywords went from uh, expressions such such as uh, paper A disproves paper B. So quite strong signals of of, of a negative citation to uh, things that are more uh, smooth, like in contrast with that paper, we find uh, X, Y, Z. Um, so it that quite a large spectrum of uh, of the various ways uh, researchers can disagree with each other. Uh, but what was quite striking is that, well, negative citations are quite uncommon. Uh, so for all of the, the data set that, that we looked at, they basically accounted for one reference out of 300, which is, uh, as you can see here in the in the slide, whoops, sorry, about 0.30% of all, of all references that are being made. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, disagreement was much higher in the social sciences and humanities than in mathematics and computer science, uh, and by basically one order of magnitude uh, in terms of differences. So these negative citations are quite uncommon, and actually most references are either neutral or they will be positive, and in many ways having a neutral citation means that it's kind of a positive one. Maybe the less interesting part of that, uh, of that paper is that the disagreement by field kind of followed the hierarchy of sciences from Auguste Comte. So Auguste Comte is one of the, one could say the founding father of sociology. Uh, and he had a hierarchy of discipline based on two variables, complexity and consensus. And his argument was that the more complex a phenomena is, the less consensus is gonna be on the various uh, analysis that, that come out when, when one studies it. And so, in his argument, physics is less complex. And here, I don't know if there's physicists on the line, and I, I know I offended many physicists by saying that. And the, 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 the meaning of complexity here, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means that it's predictable. So physical phenomena are predictable. Humans are much more difficult to predict. So it's a more complex system to study. And so the disagreement level that we observe in the data is actually quite similar to this kind of contrast between complex field, less complex field, and less consensual, more consensual uh, discipline. So going back to the criticism there, uh, sorry, uh, negative citations are not that much of a problem. And quite strikingly, uh, these negative citations are quite stable uh, over time. We, we observe, and this is still something that I'm uh, struggling to uh, to explain, we, we, we found a decrease actually in disagreement level in physics and engineering. And so basically physicists and engineers are increasingly agreeing uh, with each other. Basically disagreement uh, reduced by a factor of 50% of by, by half over the basically 16 years that we, uh, that we study, which may be due, and I'll stop on that, uh, which may be due to the higher use of computational tools and stuff like that. Um, there's also, of course, in citation, the concept of perfunctory or superficial uh, citations. Uh, those are a bit more difficult to assess, but one way to look at them is to look at where do we cite in research papers. And so this is from a, a piece we did a couple of years ago where we took all papers published in PLUS and mapped where documents were being cited in the text progression, which is here on the x-axis. And what we see is that the vast, vast, vast majority of cited references appear in the beginning of the intro, which is, of course, for anyone who has written a paper, kind of know that this is where you set the stage. But it's also where you actually do so in, on many ways, in a superficial manner, where you don't necessarily engage with all of the literature that you cite. You just mention that it exists. Uh, then very little references appear in the method, some in the results. And then one could argue that the main documents for the citing documents are the one that are actually discussed. They are the one that appear in the discussion and the conclusion. And of course, some of those cited documents in the discussion are also cited in the intro, but the ones that are cited in the discussions are in many ways probably more important to the argument that the authors are, are making. So that kind of suggests that there's a sizable amount of references that are being made uh, to kind of show that we know what we're talking about, but they're not necessarily engaged with in the document. Uh, we also often hear that most papers are unsighted, uh, which is of course not true. Most papers are actually cited. It's only a matter of time. 
for them to be cited. So those are just uh, rates of citedness uh, by, by field. Of course, there's a variation across disciplines with biomedical sciences, psychology being pretty high there. Uh, not many papers remain unsighted after 15 years. In the arts and humanities, these values are actually lower, and we do see that most research papers uh, remain unsighted. There's actually two reasons for that. One is, of course, a data issue, where papers in those fields may be cited in books, may be cited in other types of documents that are not well, well recorded in the typical databases that we use. And the other element is the non-cumulative nature of arts and humanities. Uh, where basically having impact and even scientific impact doesn't mean that other papers are going to are going to cite you. So there's also epistemological reference uh, differences there that play a uh, that play a role. Uh, which brings me to well, citation cartels. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't say much on that, which is of course kind of a form of an organized self citation group uh, to talk about self citation, which of course can be observed at many levels at the journal level. Um, and this is actually one example of where many have found citation cartels, especially in the context of journal impact factor inflation. Um, and we do see an increase of those over time. So more and more journals are actually increasing their, their self-citation, especially in the two-year journal impact factor window, uh, which is, I believe, slightly problematic. And some journals were actually removed from uh, the journal citation reports because of that. Uh, we also observe strong national uh, self-citation biases. Uh, so if you look at the diagonal there with the citing in a cited country, basically every country cites their own work more than expected, uh, which is of course normal from a <clears throat> sorry topic point of view, um, where in, in many fields, especially in the social science, but not only there, uh, research that has been published by people around you are, are, is more likely to be on topics that are also relevant to you. Uh, but there is something a bit more to that, um, which brings me to the key element here, which are self-citations. And there I'm mostly interested in two self-citations at the individual level. And in a few minutes, I'll make a clear distinction between paper level self citations and author level self citations. Uh, so there's two conceptions for these self citations. One of them is kind of a uh, positive way of seeing self citation, which is that citing your own work is just normal, that you're building on the stuff you did previously. Um, and of course you are aware of the work that, that, that you did. Um, and that it's just a normal feature of research activity and of the cumulative nature and of the career progression of, of research. And using that as a, uh, as a framework or a, as a view for self-citation, uh, in that case, they should be used in, in any type of evaluation or in assessment of the impact of researchers. Um, and one key element there also is that in order to self-cite, one needs to publish another article in which they're going to cite the previous one. And that paper has to go to peer review. So there's kind of a vetting process. It's, it's not as if you're tweeting where there's no barrier and you can tweet your paper as much as you want. In the case of uh, self-citation, there is still a review process. Uh, the other conception is one of a slightly more deviant behavior uh, where one could say when you have impact, you're actually influencing other, you're not influencing yourself. Um, and that they are driven mostly, they would be driven mostly by uh, wanting to look better on these various indicators. And in that context, uh, they should be excluded for, uh, from research evaluation. Uh, I must say that the, the, the title of the talk has a clear question. I'm not sure I come up with a clear answer, uh, but I'll leave that to you to, uh, <laughs> to discuss. So, um, and that's one example of these crazy self-citations. So that's a paper uh, that has more uh, references there than words. So 182 words, 212 references. All references are from the first author who works at a university that does not exist. Uh, of course, that's not published in a very serious journal, but it kind of shows an extreme case of those uh, in that case of self references. So before going into the, let's say the the detailed methods, we just need to have a little discussion on what is it to self-cite and making a clear distinction between self-citations and self-references. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, they're all based on the fact that there's an overlap between the authorship of the citing paper 
and the authorship of the cited papers. But if I want to measure self-citations, I need to take as a denominator all of the citations that I've received, which means that I only control the numerator, which are the self-citations. The total citation that I've received are, of course, determined by my impact, by the fact that also others have cited me. Uh, and of course, as you may expect, people with very, very high citation rates are going to have low self-citation rates because there's a limit to the number of papers that one can publish. In the case of self-references, one author or one researcher controls both the numerator and the denominator um, because that would be calculated as of all of the references that I have made in my own papers, what is the proportion that I made to my, uh, to my own? So same numerator, but different denominator. Um, and of course, different interpretation and totally different results as you're gonna see in a few minutes. And, and as I mentioned, only self-references are fully depending on the author's behavior. So clear example here, I made 1000 references in my career. I cited my own work 100 times. My percentage of self-references is 10, simple. All citation I've received is 500. I'm not so cited. I've cited myself 100 times. My self citation rate is 20%. So that's the first conceptual issue. I, I hope it's clear, but happy to answer any, any remaining question. The second element, and this is something that is, uh, is, is partly a consequence of the way bibliometric databases were built, is that we need to distinguish between paper level and researcher level self citation. So if you go on the web of science, everything is at the paper level. And so you're going to see, oh, that paper has 10% self-citations, which of course is true. But given that it's different sets of co-authors on both the citing and the cited paper, we cannot take that score and apply it to individuals. Um, so there was a list, and I think some of you were involved in that a couple of years ago, where a list of most productive authors with citations. And, and what, one of the triggers actually for that paper was the physicist Michael Gretzer, who had received 2,282 citations, of which seven were self-citation. I remember looking at that, I said, wow, the guy wrote, I don't know, 5,000 papers to be able to cite himself almost 17,000 times. But what happens is these are co-author self-citations. So this guy writes a paper, then a co-author goes and cite that paper, but in the web of science, these get rolled into this guy's own self-citation. So we need to make sure that we make that distinction here. And here's how we do it. So again, we have a citing paper here and a cited paper. So that's a paper that I co-authored with my colleague Rodrigo Costa from the Netherlands. And that's a paper we cite on which Rodrigo was a co-author. Um, so at the paper level, there's no distinction. This is a self-citation and a self-reference. But when you do things at the author level, it does become a self-reference for Rodrigo because he's on both. But for me, it's an external reference. I had nothing to do with that paper that we cited. But also for his co-authors, we should not say, hey, Ted Van Luren or Maria Bordons, who are the two other co-authors, you are self-citing on that. No, 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 no. It's one of the co-authors that cite the paper. So I guess that I, I guess that's clearly understood, but it, it in order to do one could say sociological analysis of individuals, we need to make sure that we have the right measurement. And I, this is how to do that, I believe, for paper level. Okay, so the challenge for that was, of course, author disambiguation. Um, we needed to have a good author disambiguation to be able to do that, and this is what we're having right now. Okay, so moving to the research questions, and I'll try to go a bit more quickly. So what are the dynamics of self-references and self-citations? How do they evolve as a function of one's career? Um, and bottom line, what we're trying to answer there is, can you become rich scientifically or citationally on, with self-citations? Is it a way to actually really improve your impact? And are there gender differences in self-citations? And the second question is, indeed, how similar or dissimilar are self-citation versus others? And the hypothesis there is that if self-citations are a deviant behavior, the papers that are self-cited should be less relevant. They should be stuff that is added, but not really related to the content of the citing paper. So what did we take? Uh, so 
Authorities and big question is something that really, really improved in the last couple of years. Uh, the Leiden group has developed a relatively good algorithm, but I believe that with BERT, uh, the BERT AI-ish type of algorithm, we would be able to do something better now. Uh, but basically what they were using were a few heuristics like the name and given name, institution collaborated, collaborator, cited references, email addresses to kind of say, okay, like this is Vincent that works in science of science, and this is another Vincent who works in another topic. We had uh, overall, so this data for about 51 million papers. The algorithm does have a splitting problem uh, whereby someone like John actually would probably have a few identities given the various field in which he publishes. Uh, so it does have issue, it's imperfect. It overestimates the number of authors, uh, but there's a way to do some cutoffs with numbers of papers. Anyways, uh, publication data is for uh, the last roughly 40 years. Um, and we determine career age by year of first publication. And there we're looking at four types of citations of, or references. So the direct co -auth, direct sorry, authors of citations. So I cite a paper on which I was a co-author. You have the co-authors of citation, which is the one could say the first degree, uh, like the case I presented with my colleague Rodrigo. So it's the co-author of the papers that cite the paper. Then you have the collaborators. So we reconstructed the collaboration network where people that uh, researchers have collaborated with within the last five years are considered as part of the network. And then external citations, which are the ones that don't fall in any of the three above. So what do we see? Finally, going into the results. In blue, you have the self citations. And in orange, you have the self references and you see totally different patterns. So let's take medical sciences, which is on the top right here. Uh, when you start your career, so at career age zero, no one knows you. No one knows your work. So who is likely to cite your work? Well, it's you. But then as your career progresses, the proportion of self-citation decreases uh, and, and actually continues to do so until career age uh, 36, which was the highest in our, uh, in our database. So self-citations are, of course, a function of one's overall citation rates. Uh, and so the more you publish, the more you are cited, the more you're known, and therefore your own citations weigh less and less and less in all of the citations that you receive. On the other hand, self-references behave, again, in a totally opposite manner. When you write your first paper, how many previous papers can you cite? Of course, the answer is zero. But then as you write more papers, you drag them along over the next papers that you write. And obviously, your proportion of self-references will go up. And it kind of, let's say, more or less stabilizes roughly around 10% in most of the field. It's a bit higher in some, it's a bit lower in, in others, but roughly the, the target, <laughs> in a way, if we want to look at deviant behavior or normal behavior, it's at about 10% for researchers who are, uh, who are senior. But there's, of course, other variables to, to consider. Um, now looking at the other types of uh, citation. So now we looked at direct citation, you remember co-authors, as well as collaborators. They kind of follow the same trend, at least for the direct and the co-authors. So as career progresses, self-citation decrease and self-reference increase. The only thing that increases in both cases are the collaborators' references and citations, which are, again, a bit more far away from, uh, from the authors themselves. Um, we wanted also to look at the age, the, the effect, or at least the relationship between uh, age. I'm oh, sorry. Oh. Between age and so I'm just trying to move the, 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 the top of the screen. That won't work. We'll continue. Um, so, uh, so what we we're seeing as a function of age, uh, it peaks with basically, and the key thing there, the, the, I don't think the figure is very clear, but self-citations and self-references are younger, which, which is kind of an obvious thing in the sense that as an author, I am aware of what I published before. So the average age of these self-citations is younger 
than for citations that come from other. It kind of shows in a way the, the diffusion of a document across the scientific uh, community. Now looking at whether one can become rich with, uh, with self-citation. So we basically compile H indices for, for all of the authors in, in our database. So an observed H index on the uh, x-axis for, uh, for various domains, and then the difference in the H index, be it in, in absolute terms or in relative terms. Uh, so that the delta and percentages in the, in the, at the bottom line. And what we're seeing is that, of course, there, there's an increase in, in all three. And of course, the H index is higher when you include the collaborators' uh, self-citations. Uh, but what we're seeing is that it does not increase much. So, of course, for very low H indices, uh, which are the which is at the left, of course, of the of the figures, uh, it increases pretty high, pretty quickly with the inclusion of these self citations. But the the network effect, so the self citations of the collaborators or the self citations coming from the collaborators, can indeed have an effect on the H index. So they are the one that is that are more likely uh, to influence it, uh, to influence it. So the the answer there to the question is that. Direct self-citations have little effect, except in low H indices. Uh, Co-authors have very low effects, but then those of collaborators uh, are, uh, are having a higher impact. I'm being distracted here because my screen tells me that the meeting stops in one minute, so maybe everything will stop at that point. If not, I thank you for the, uh, if, if it does so, I thank you for the invitation, but let's hope that it does not stop in less than one minute. Um, then a few correlates of self-references. Uh, we looked at three things there, external citations, gender, and year of first publication to get a proxy for age. Uh, with external cit citations, what we try to look at is, are authors that are more self-cited also more cited by others? Uh, and what we're seeing here is pretty clear. Those authors that are self-citing a lot are also cited a lot by others. So they're not; these authors are not behaving differently in terms of who they cite. Everyone cites this guy, and he also cites them. Um, so th there's a, also a gender component where, unsurprisingly, men are more self-citing than women, controlling again for age and a number of publications. Uh, and you kind of see that. I didn't insist on that, but. The, the x-axis and all of the, these figures are the total number of publications from those uh, from those authors. Um, and finally, year of first publication. Uh, we kind of had an hypothesis that old people would be more, more highly self-cited, and it's actually the opposite. Young folks are actually more self-citing their own work than their colleagues when they were the same, their older colleagues when they were the same age. Um, of course, that's just another way of presenting the percentage of self-citation for, for men and women, where basically you see a clear difference for, for different bins of, of citations. Uh, and then that's the kind of the gains that are being uh, obtained, citation gains from, a, from including self-citation. Okay, second part of analysis, I'll try to wrap that in, in five minutes. Um, so basically taking all of the papers that add an abstract and doing the similarity between the abstract of the citing and the abstract of the cited uh, paper, which led to uh, about 15 million pairs of citing and cited abstracts. Uh, and given that this is duplicated by number of author, we ended up having about 1.7 uh, billion of these citing cited comparison, uh, which computation really was, was quite, uh, quite demanding. Uh, so very standard way, I, I think, it's something that we're still working on and we may actually use more, more advanced algorithm, but this was more of a TFIDF type of analysis, uh, trying to see if roughly the same words were being, uh, were being used. Um, it's not so much about the, uh, saying semantic similarity is probably pushing it a bit uh, here. So what do we see? Well, we actually see the opposite of what was our cynical hypothesis, which, were the, which was that self-citation would be less related. It's actually the opposite. So self-cited documents are much more similar. So we have the distributions here. So the distribution skews towards much more similarity in all fields when it's a self-citation or 
or self-reference. Uh, then when it's the collaborator, then when it's an external. So actually, all of us here are being cited by people we don't know in ways we did not expect <laughs> or in, in, in a way that that may not have been our own intent. And I have a colleague who actually always looks at what is the citation context of his own paper? And he was saying that basically one paper out of two uh, that was citing him did not understand, under, uh, understood what he meant. So it's an ex interesting exercise to, for us to, uh, uh, to make. Um, as a function of age, these things are quite stable. Again, much more similar for direct uh, than for other types of citation. This is observed in every field. Um, and same again as function of age, but also as a function of the age of the documents that are cited. So if it's a self citation of an old paper I've written, again, uh, one thing is sure. So similarity decreases with time because we use different words sometimes over time to maybe describe the same things, uh, but we keep the same orders between the three uh, category. Um, the only thing that we saw that was a bit different was if we look at these authors that are self-citing a lot. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at, let's say, those researchers that are perhaps a bit deviant, that are citing their own work at a higher proportion uh, than others. And what you actually see is that for those, indeed, similarity is lower. So there is indeed a subset of researchers that are self-citing more than average, and for those, similarity is lower. And so when one could argue that indeed it may not be as, as, uh, as relevant. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, and it was only true for the social sciences and humanities, men self-cite their own work even if it's less relevant than women do. So there's a difference here in terms of relevance that is quite, uh, quite clear. Okay. So jumping to conclusions now. So, uh, so self-citation and self-references follow a totally different path. Self-citation decrease over time. Self-references kind of increase and then reach a threshold and become quite, uh, quite stable. And, and to me, this kind of suggests a normal feature or normal use of self-references. You build on your previous work, so uh, your self-reference increase, and you are also cited by others as you, are, as you become more cited or more old, and so your self-citation uh, decrease. Uh, Self-references were more common for younger documents, so of course I know my own work, so I can cite it first. Um, external citations are correlated with self cite and this is something that I believe is quite important. Those, in most cases, who are citing their own work a lot are also cited by, by others. Uh, Direct self-citations do have little effect on the H-index, which means that you don't become rich with your self-citations once you've reached a threshold that comes quite early in, in a career. But citations from co collaborators do have an important effect, and women are self-referencing less than men, conversely, are self-citing uh, more. Uh, and finally, older cohorts, uh, actually, no, it's younger cohorts, sorry, are more self-referencing. Um, there's also in there kind of mechanical or, or, or things that are kind of driven by the data maybe more than behavior. So a uh, young scholar cannot self-cite much, uh, but because they don't have as much thing to, uh, to cite. Um, and in that context, given these cohort different, not everyone can be held to the same standard. Uh, my expected self-citation rate is going to be very different than the self-citation rate of my PhD students or, or postdocs. So there's something important to consider here. So to conclude, so contrary to our hypothesis, which as I mentioned earlier was perhaps slightly more cynical, self-references are actually more relevant to the citing paper than non-self-citations, uh, especially for those made by women. So our results suggest so far that self-citation are, in most cases, a normal feature of knowledge accumulation. There is not as much to worry about, but there is indeed a uh, subset of, uh, of researchers uh, for which it's a bit more deviant. So again, I thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer all of the questions you have.